Good afternoon, everyone. This is Adele Newton. I'm the executive director of CSCAN InfoCAN. And it's my pleasure today to introduce Jimmy Zhu, who is the 2019 CS Can uh, Canadian Computer Science Distinguished Dissertation Award winner. Um, Jimmy wrote his thesis while he his PhD thesis while he was at U of T under the supervision of Professor Faith Ellen. And he's currently a research fellow at the University of Michigan. And today he's going to talk about his thesis. And his, as you can see, his talk is entitled Colorful Tales of Colorless Tasks. Um, after the presentation, or if you have questions during the presentation, please put them in the Q&A. And we'll go to questions after the presentation. So for now, Jimmy, I'm going to um, hand it over to you. OK. Uh... Thanks, Adele, for the introduction. And thanks, everybody, for turning up to the talk. Uh, so I guess also thanks to CS Can Info Canon for the award. Uh, all right, so let's just jump right in if things work. OK, so what is the purpose of this talk? I just want to tell you some stories from my PhD and uh, the work I did in distributed computing. And I guess like one of the main themes of the talk will be that uh, I encountered more failure than success. And also, I guess like, you know, while I worked hard, I would say that uh, probably I was more lucky. And interestingly, uh, my Chinese name, Le Qi, my father named me Le Qi because, you know, it kind of sounds like lucky in uh, when you say it with a Chinese accent, I guess. All right, and uh, if there's anything that uh, I suppose I want you to take away from the talk is that uh, this appears to be a good strategy. When things seem tough, just keep going and have faith that it'll be all right. And uh, speaking of faith, I think like one of my biggest uh, lucky breaks was having faith as my advisor. Um, you know, you can see that I wrote many adjectives about her. Uh, but, you know, in particular, I think I was lucky in the sense that basically from the very beginning, she gave me a clear direction for my PhD. And in fact, I think it was in our one of our first meetings, she told me this, if you can determine the space complexity of consensus, I'll give you a PhD. Okay, sounds good to me. Uh, and I guess like one reason I was super attracted to this problem is because it's, it feels like a very natural problem. And it was uh, kind of amazing to me that it was unsolved. Okay, so what is consensus? Um, well, we have a number of processes N and they each begin with some private input. You can think of it as a preference for something. And they have to decide collectively one of the uh, inputs to output. So as an example, Suppose we have two processes, A and B, and you know they have private inputs zero and one, and they basically just have to choose one of the inputs to output. For example, they might say zero, and you know back in my PhD, uh, you know clear example of consensus was when we were trying to figure out where to go for lunch. And uh, so, what is space complexity? Well, to define space complexity, I have to sort of tell you a bit about the model. Um, here we have the two processes A and B again. There might be more, but let's just focus on two. And you know, basically the only way they can talk to each other is uh, through a number of registers, which are initially blank. And uh, basically like, if you want to write a program for a distributed problem, you essentially have to give a protocol where you specify the code that each process or computer is going to run. And uh, basically, it just uh, specifies what steps they take, for example, like whether they read this register or that register, what, what they write, and also possibly the values they output. Uh, it turns out without loss of generality, because we're not uh, concerned with time complexity, we can sort of assume that uh, processes behave in a very structured way in their algorithms. So they just 
repeatedly do the following. They write the full history of what they've seen, and then they read all the registers at once. Uh, so you can sort of view a process as a tree where, you know, at the root, uh, it begins by writing uh, its input to some register, and then it reads all registers, and then you have basically more of the same. You write, you read, you write, you read, and so forth. And to make things interesting, uh, and this is where asynchrony uh, comes into play, there is an adversarial scheduler that decides the order in which processes take steps. So in particular, here's this like red guy here, and I've sort of uh, outlined what the first step of each process is or what the current step of each process is. So as an example, um, the adversary might say, process A, take a step, in which case, you know, if the input of process A was zero, the first register would get the value zero. And then scheduler might say process B, take a step. And similarly, we would get this here. And then it might say process A. So process A now has read zero one. And similarly, process B reads zero one. But actually, there's no reason the adversary has to play fair. I mean, the previous uh, schedule that I showed you was very fair, just alternatingly uh, let processes take steps. But the process might, or the scheduler might pay particular attention to a, a specific process. For example, it might say process A go, and then it might say process A go again, and then it might say process A go again. And I guess like, what is the point? The point is that uh, it's an adversarial scheduler. So it might just be uh, giving steps to a, a particular subset of processes and the remaining processes, you can think of them as crashed, but nobody knows if they're crashed. So this is like one of the, I guess, difficulties of uh, distributed computing. Okay, so as I alluded to in the previous slide, uh, there are some difficulties in distributed computing in particular. Um, it's about what people see. And so to sort of make this more concrete, I just wanna draw some possible states of processes after uh, each process takes two steps. So as we saw in like the first example, um, if we considered A, B, A, B, uh, the processes would have the following states. Uh, when I say read zero, it just means like this is the value it read from the other process because every process was writing to its own register. And uh, there's a bunch of schedules that result in the same state. But uh, interestingly, there is also this schedule AABB, which uh, results in process A basically reading nothing from the other process. But process B, on the other hand, actually gets to see what process A wrote. And symmetrically, the same thing could happen for process B. And I guess like the main, dif the main difficulty when designing distributed algorithms is this. Process uh, B sees A, but it wonders, hmm, did it see me or not? Because the state of process B here is consistent with two possible realities. There's one where process A saw B, and there's one where process A did not see B. And similarly uh, for process A. And as we'll see, this uh, results in a lot of complications. So uh, to formalize this somewhat, let's just uh, change our notation somewhat. And let's just view the previous picture as a graph where we have an edge between two process states, if and only if, the two states can simultaneously occur at uh, some configuration. And just in terms of the previous picture, we noticed that uh, the resulting graph is connected, at least when processes each take two steps. And uh, well, let's, in general, we could consider what happens if they uh, both take an even number of steps, so they get to finish doing their uh, read and write block. And we can think about the same graph. And an interesting fact, a remarkable fact, in fact, 
is that it is connected. And the beautiful corollary of this fact is that uh, there is no finite bound on the number of steps each process takes until it gets the sort of output of value. And just to sort of see this uh, very easily, suppose this was not the case. There is some finite number of steps that uh, if every process takes that many steps, they would terminate. Well, let's focus on two particular states that uh, could occur. There's a possibility that the scheduler uh, puts all steps of A first. And so A only sees the stealth. And also it's possible that the scheduler puts all steps of B first. So B only sees itself. And because the graph is connected, we have a path from this state of A to the state of B. And uh, okay, so let's think about what values uh, processes A and B must output. Uh, well, A has only seen itself. So for all it knows, process B could have input zero. And because we had this condition that, you know, a processes should only output inputs that they have seen, basically the only output that A can give here is zero. And similarly for B. Now, we assume that everybody has output a value along this path. So let's think about what value this guy, B, would output in uh, this particular configuration. Well, by consensus, uh, you know, they have to agree. So B actually has to output zero here as well. And similarly, at this configuration, A has to output zero. And if you just keep doing this, we quickly realize, uh oh, we get into a problem. So at this configuration here, we have that process A output zero because it was implied by this chain of you know, causation. And then we said that process B has to output one here, which means that you know, there's a contradiction and it can't possibly be that everybody has decided. Good. So uh, this raises the question, why are we here? It's not a philosophical question but a very concrete one. Um, we've just shown that we cannot solve consensus because in the worst case, an adversarial scheduler can cause, you know, they can find a schedule where no process ever outputs any value. Okay, so can, this result is uh, known as the impossibility of deterministic weight-free consensus or FLP named after uh, the authors, Fisher, Lynch, and Patterson. And uh, I just want to remark that the proof I showed you is uh, quite different from their original proof. And uh, I guess there is a reason I did this and you'll get to see that why later on. Uh, but it turns out the reason why we're here is that you know if the processes have access to uh, private coins, so you can think uh, basically private randomness, then it turns out it is actually possible for them to solve consensus. And in particular, uh, we can guarantee that they will output a value with probability one. And we call this condition randomized weight free. And I guess like for some intuition on why this is true, you can just imagine whenever the processes see each other and they're confused about what to do, there's a, there's a guy who thinks it should be one and there's a guy who thinks it should be zero. They can basically just flip a coin and change their preference randomly. And with some non-zero probability, they will both you know, change their preference to the same thing and reach agreement. Okay, so what's the problem that we wanna solve? Well, we wanna know what is the minimum number of registers needed to solve randomized weight-free consensus. Um, in particular, I guess like in the previous examples that I was showing you, I sort of assumed that every process was writing to its own register. In which case, you know, there's n registers uh, that we need to allocate. But, and sort of like every time you do a write, you check out what everybody else is doing by reading their registers. Well, it's conceivable that you could actually save space and like maybe use less registers and possibly even save time. And, uh, you know, this is the question do we need n or can we get away with less? So, a brief history of the problem. Uh, Asmus and Herlihy proved that uh, n registers is sufficient. Uh, they gave a randomized algorithm using exactly n. And 
my advisor, Faith, and Herlich and Shavit proved that uh, you need something al along the order of uh, square root of n registers. Um, this was, I guess, in 1993. And uh, a long time passes and something in inconsequential happens. I start my master's at the University of Toronto. And, uh, you know, Faith at the time was actually, so I guess, okay, the story is this, uh, Faith tells me this problem. I start thinking about it, but Faith was actually on sabbatical at the time. So instead of uh, focusing on, you know, the main form of CS I should be focusing on, I, I, I was uh, concerned with some other forms of CS. And uh, okay, anyway, she comes back, I start my PhD and uh, I began to seriously work on the problem around this time. And I got my first result. And uh, not many people know about this result, but I think it's uh, the story is somewhat interesting. So in uh, May, 2015, I got my first result about the problem and I submitted it to a conference. I was extremely excited because the conference was uh, gonna occur in Japan and uh, Tokyo. And uh, yeah, it seemed like a great way to travel to Japan. Anyway, so I proved uh, basically matching lower and upper bounds for a uh, for the case of randomized consensus when the protocols are sort of simple or nice. Uh, in particular, they're anonymous and memoryless. Forget about what that means because it's not that important. Uh, to my surprise, at the same time and submitted to the same conference, uh, basically were papers that did a lot better than what I did. Uh, so in particular, Buzid, Reynal, and Sutra, they gave an algorithm for a generalized uh, version of consensus called case out agreement. We'll get to this problem later on. And basically consensus is K equal to one and they get the same bound as me. And furthermore, uh, Galashvili uh, proved the lower bound, a linear lower, lower bound on the number of registers needed for anonymous consensus. And in, in particular, yeah, he managed to drop the memoryless assumption and he won the best paper award. Uh, okay, so I got scooped. And the interesting, I guess, sort of the annoying thing is really there was no results about uh, this sort of stuff in the span of time. So I guess something like 12 years, 22 years, <laughs> pardon me. Uh, there was literally no results about this. And then at the same time as me, Galash Philly shows up. And, you know, I love this GIF, GIF from Biden that sort of, you know, one of his trademark expressions. Uh, and also another thing that don't, people don't know is that uh, basically a, a few months before this result, uh, I was informed that my master's thesis was uh, scooped as well. You know, somehow there was a paper that appeared uh, sometime in 2014 that did the same thing, but you know, it was a uh, corollary and they did it better. Great. And finally, uh, to add insult to injury, I guess, uh, my talk at, so eventually, uh, I guess this result got accepted as a brief announcement to the conference in Japan and I got to go, which was great. But uh, my talk was uh, 10 minutes after Gilashvili's talk. And uh, during the talk, I made an extremely awkward joke about getting scooped that uh, nobody laughed at. Come on, man. All right, so. What happened next was uh, after the talk, I went back to Toronto and I went crazy for three weeks and I tried very hard to solve the problem. And uh, some people might recognize this picture. This is a picture of the ceiling of the theory office at night. And sometimes you get a peek of the moon through the window. And uh, yeah, I gave up actually. But uh, one night, whoops. One night, surprisingly, um, I was just sort of laying there. I couldn't fall asleep. And I just began to you know, picture the things that I knew in my head and miraculously somehow the pieces you know, fell together and I found the proof at 4 a.m., 4.30 a.m. And I woke up in like, uh, got out of bed in a hurry, emailed, wrote the proof up, emailed it to Faith at 6.30. We met, uh, I guess like every day. Thanks Faith for that. Uh, no, I mean that in a really nice way. She was like really spending so much time with me uh, during the write-up of this paper. 
And we actually managed to make the stock deadline, which was I think in like three or four days. And uh, during stock, I, I guess like I received some nice award for this paper. And uh, an interesting question was asked by Professor Nir Shavit, who is uh, incidentally Galashvili's advisor. And Nir asked me, where is this going? What's next? And uh, at the talk, I did not really have a great answer. So I just, I just said, you know, uh, let's generate some papers. And, uh, you know, of course that's actually what happened. So essentially for the rest of my PhD, I, uh, I worked on extending the result uh, from 2015 to basically other settings. Uh, in particular, uh, in joint work with Faith, Nir, and uh, Rati, some guy named Rati, uh, we considered what happens if you have stronger primitives, for example, uh, if the registers, you know, you could somehow do uh, better instructions like, such as test and set, more powerful instructions. We also generalized uh, the bound to, uh, you know, problems that seem very similar to consensus, in particular case set agreement. And this was joint work with Faith and Rati as well. And finally, we considered something called extension-based proofs, which was uh, joint work with Dan Alistair, James Absness, Faith and Rati. And here are the pictures of these uh, fine gentlemen. You've already seen what Faith looks like. And I guess like there's one picture that's uh, conspicuously missing and it's this guy. So I guess like after the, after the consensus result, I emailed Rati Galashvili, incidentally, the guy who scooped me. And uh, I suggested we, you know, work on thinking about uh, problems that are similar. So in particular, we were actually both somehow also correlated in that we were thinking about generalizations of the bound to uh, stronger primitives. And I must say like, this was probably one of the best decisions in my life. Uh, so here's some nice words about him. He's the smartest guy I've met, blah, blah, blah. Don't want him to get a big head. Hopefully he's not here. Uh, and yeah, we, we became good friends and uh, we had a lot of fun uh, in working together. Okay, so now, uh, to sort of describe the work that we did, um, it's uh, kind of appropriate for me to talk about set agreement, which is uh, a generalization of consensus that sort of sparked our interest, uh, or sort of the, I guess, the most important results, in my opinion, of the thesis. All right, so what is this problem? Uh, well, we just have basically, uh, we have k plus one processes. And uh, they just have to decide on at most K of the inputs to output. It's just like consensus, but basically we give you some slack. So for example, um, we might consider the problem of selecting two options out of uh, many options. So this would be two set agreement, all right? Selecting at most two options, I guess. And we might have three processes. They each have some private preference. And we're allowed to, you know, they're allowed to output collectively at most two different uh, values. And, you know, a practical problem back then uh, with my friend Jay was, and Sefer was to figure out what we would eat at Chinese restaurants uh, given a limited budget. So we were solving two set agreements. And to just sort of return to the picture that I had for consensus, um, you might not be surprised, but it was a bit surprising to me to find out that actually uh, you cannot solve two set agreement as well. And in the same sense as that you cannot solve consensus. And, but the proof is very, it's, it's the same, but different uh, in the following sense. So instead of, so we can look at the graph of uh, all possible process states after some number of steps. And here we have, I guess, one more color. So we're considering the case when there's only three processes, you know, we have A, B, and C. And, uh, you know, instead of just edges, we have this thing called a simplex, which is, you know, essentially a triangle that uh, indicates uh, three process states could simultaneously coexist. So it's just a natural generalization of the graph when there's only two processes. Uh, and a rather deep fact, and 
I think this is a beautiful fact, in fact, is that uh, the simplicial complex, so this big thing that uh, this blob of triangles and edges that we've uh, described, is always two connected in the sense that, uh, well, informally, there are no two dimensional holes. So I guess the analogy is like uh, in the graph, being one connected means, you know, there's always paths, but two connected means we can't, you know, find a gap in like the shape. Hopefully that made sense. And uh, using this, they were able to basically do a similar argument, but this is with a bit more uh, tricky setup. They were able to show that, you know, if, um, if you could provide some finite bound on when every process outputs a value, we could just consider the simplicial complex after uh, that many steps. And you know, using the fact that it's too connected, you know, they showed that it's possible to find a triangle. So one of these guys here, where every process outputs a different value, which is of course a violation of two agreement. And uh, okay, so this proof was, in my opinion, very special. And uh, I want, it's uh, unfortunately, I cannot uh, sort of uh, go into details of why it's special, but I, I prepared an analogy that hopefully lends some intuition to the situation. So the analogy is this, we can imagine that um, the scheduler or, or a prover has a climber and it wants to explore this great big mountain and sort of reach the apex, reach the top. And the mountain, of course, is like that simplicial complex that I just described to you. It's like, we, I just told you as a big blob, you can think about it as a mountain. And uh, of course, what is the top? The top is uh, the bad configuration, the configuration where every process outputs a different value and violates agreement. And in terms of this analogy, um, we can look at what the FLP, so this is, remember the impossibility proof for consensus is done by these guys called Fisher, Lynch and Patterson. And we can sort of examine what they would do on like uh, this big, I guess, blob or the mountain. And the analogy is like, essentially the climber is, you know, it's living in the moment uh, and it just, the guy just repeatedly looks for a handhold that looks nice from his current position. So for instance, he starts at the bottom, he climbs up one step because this part looked pretty good. And then he looks again, oh, this part looks pretty good. He climbs up and so forth. So it's a very local and I guess, narrow view of the mountain. And uh, in terms of these other guys, uh, this, which who proved the impossibility of set agreement, you can think of them as sort of, you know, getting into a helicopter, going around the mountain and seeing it the entire lay of the land before they sort of figure out the path. And I guess like one of the interesting results in the thesis, uh, which was the joint work with Dan, Jim, Faith, Rati, and me, uh, is that essentially ex we formalize the notion of what it means to be living in the moment and local uh, in terms of exploring this weird thing. And we showed that if you try to live in the moment and don't have a helicopter, you will fail. And intuitively this does make sense, right? I mean, if you sort of blindly try to climb up a mountain without really understanding what the mountain is like, you know, you, you could probably get stuck at some point and then you would probably need to backtrack and do it again. So you might as well just save yourself the effort and get a help call helicopter if you have one. Okay, so now, uh, I guess like I want to explain somewhat why I was actually very, very lucky in 2015 with the consensus lower bound. Um, and it's in light of this result. So basically, if you view the proof that I gave for uh, consensus, uh, which was an like N minus one lower bound on the number of registers needed, I hope I mentioned that previously. Uh, 
you realize that the proof falls under the framework of an extension-based proof. And uh, in particular, you can view the result as a generalization of a FLP. But in like that proof, I'm constructing a very particular uh, long schedule in which uh, no process decides any value. And furthermore, many registers get accessed during the schedule. And you know, sort of if you view it this way, you quickly see that a very reasonable conjecture given our uh, previous work is that there is no extension-based proof that can prove a non-constant space lower bound for two set agreements. Uh, this is something that we strongly believe, but unfortunately we've never written it up because I think the definitions would get kind of hairy. Um, but you know, in other words, if for some weird reason I hadn't worked on the consensus problem, if it had been solved earlier on, and the open problem was finding a space lower bound for two set agreement, uh, I would say, you know, with good chance, I would not be sitting here giving this talk. And uh, actually, I guess one of the reasons uh, the previous result is interesting is because we believe that many of the open problems in our field have the same property. So let me just sort of give a high level hand wavy explanation for why this is. Uh, or rather, let me explain sort of this statement a bit more. So essentially, FLP was, you know, it was the groundbreaking paper, the impossibility of consensus. And essentially, so many papers after this result, uh, you know, used the same technique of, you know, trying to find local extensions, trying to look locally and find something that looks good and continue. And this was a very prevalent proof technique. And uh, somehow we realized, you know, with our result that this proof technique sometimes could fail. And we believe actually many of the open problems in the field, uh, they're open precisely for the same reason. We don't have a good handle on what this big shape looks like. We can prove some properties about it, such as it being connected, but we don't really understand what the big mountain looks like. And uh, if you wanna prove, for example, complexity bounds, you really need to get a handle on what the mountain is. Okay, that, that was probably extremely hand wavy, but uh, you know, I apologize. I hope somewhat intuitively uh, explained that. Okay, so now, how did we notice this uh, phenomenon? Well, okay, uh, Faith, Brati, Nir, and me, we worked on generalizing the n minus one bound uh, to the setting with stronger primitives. And we success and we were able to do this quite successfully. And uh, afterwards, Rati and I, we tried very hard to sort of do the same thing for a case set agreement. And, you know, long story short, we failed to prove anything reasonable using uh, that style of technique, even with very strong assumptions on what the protocol looks like. And we were stuck for one year. But you know, during this time, uh, Rati was also working with Dan and Jim on some one of these other problems that we believe uh, sort of cannot have a local solution. And uh, you know, due to some remarks by Dan and Jim, you know, they were actually the first ones to notice uh, this property. Um, we had a strong suspicion that the problem case that agreement because you know. There was no other proofs for the impossibility of case agreement other than doing something extremely global. You know, you have to get the helicopter, it seems. And we suspect we had a suspicion that, you know, we also needed to get a helicopter. And uh, okay, so uh, the helicopter was something called a revisionist simulation, and this was also another extremely lucky, I guess, like situation. So essentially, after being stuck for a year. Uh, we, I decided to visit Rati because, you know, he was getting depressed during the winter and so was I. And, uh, you know, maybe we would work on the problem together. And, uh, you know, I don't, I don't want to go through the whole thing, but maybe I'll just point out, as a joke, we were talking about the simulation hypothesis, how we're all living in a simulation. As a joke, I proved one of the key lemmas in the paper uh, using a simulation. And it was like a very simple simulation where basically if the lemma did not hold, then 
we would violate uh, the known results of the impossibility of set agreement. And okay, two hours later, Rati proves the other crucial lemma. And okay, the very next day, of course, we write it up and we've solved the problem that we were stuck on for a year. Like, you know, just getting something reasonable even under a uh, strong assumption. So, we, and then the next sort of, we celebrate and then, uh, you know, the next day is I think really the special day. So I was, I was hung over and uh, I sort of muttered to Rati, I was still thinking about this problem. I was like, oh man, if only we could just, you know, do a simulation from the beginning. Like the, the special property we had basically, you know, we were essentially assuming things always look kind of like the beginning. And Rati goes to the washroom, you know, and like, I think like 10 minutes later, he comes back with a strategy, this insane strategy for a large simulation that uh, basically, you know, combines the gadgets we had from day three into this one big thing. And it was, you know, I think in hindsight, this is the idea was actually pretty crazy. Uh, but, you know, because we had confidence from solving uh, the simpler version of the problem with uh, our results from day three, we were brave enough to actually go through with the idea. And the idea is like basically this, uh, we drop the prover. So uh, what does that mean? We, we uh, essentially, you think about the, we think about the prover as a scheduler. Um, so in the N minus one lower bound for consensus, uh, basically the prover is a scheduler that, you know, tries to build these executions where many registers get used. And the crazy idea is to drop the prover into a simulation where the prover is now one of the processes and it's simulating a bunch of other processes uh, uh, in this supposed protocol that uses too few registers. And we show that, you know, if the protocol uses too few registers, then we would actually be able to um, solve that agreement in a weight-free manner, which we know to be impossible. And I guess like, what is the takeaway from this? Like, why was this sort of the helicopter? Well, essentially we were, redu we were we reduced the problem to set agreement and we know the impossibility of set agreement somewhere along the way. You know, these guys, they found the helicopter and they were able to survey the mountain. And we did not know how to do this in the case when there's limited registers. But, you know, if you just borrow the machinery from uh, the other results, you could actually, you know, basically borrow their helicopter. And okay, so at the, at the airport, we generalize the result to colorless tasks, which is, I guess, the title of the thesis or one of the keywords of the thesis. And of course, you know, we just had a proof sketch and uh, it was uh, very far, I think, from being complete. But anyways, eight months later, we were able to actually prove the thing in time for stock and Faith, observe that, you know, the thing that we were doing in the simulation was essentially going back in time. And, you know, these guys in the simulation, they were changing the past. And so Faith calls it a revisionist simulation. Originally, we wanted to call it to enter the simulation because, you know, the scheduler enters the simulation. Anyways, I think it's a, this is a better title. Uh, okay. So yeah, this brings up the next failure. Uh, whoops. Unfortunately, uh, our result was rejected from stock and, you know, we actually got really bad reviews and it was like extremely lukewarm reception. We got something like overhyped, too complicated, too technical. And, uh, okay. So we submit to Potsy and the same reaction and we just barely squeeze in. And I guess like the depressing thing is like to this day, we both still consider this uh, to be our best result. But I guess like this, uh, it wasn't all bad because, you know, we actually had a lucky break as a result of this failure. Um, so for the camera ready version, we wanted to address the problem of, we wanted to address, you know, the reviews, you know, people were saying it was an extremely technical and complicated result. So you know, but we sort of knew that something like this was necessary. You know, the helicopter is not so easy to build. And uh, so we added some, you know, paragraph, not exactly helicopter and mountain, but, you know, 
something along those lines uh, explaining why the simulation is necessary or something, you know, something similar to the simulation is necessary. And of course, Faith uh, did not let this paragraph through because it was extremely wishy-washy. And uh, incidentally, uh, Professor Valerie King, who was visiting Toronto at the time, uh, just dropped by the uh, Faith's office while we were having an argument about whether or not we should you know, remove the paragraph and just agreed with Faith. You know, she suggested that we should drop the paragraph and write a paper about the result. And I guess, you know, the rest is history, I suppose. And I think it was very lucky that uh, this happened. Okay. All right, so actually, yeah, that basically wraps up the talk. Uh, so here are some open questions, I guess, um, for the future, for future young PhD students to consider. Um, can we get a tight bound for set agreement? So basically we prove something like N over K and uh, we highly conjecture the, the actual bound is N minus K. And it's very feasible that uh, the simulation technique can be improved. I mean, you know, we basically came up with the thing in a week, but you know, it took us eight months to prove it. Uh, so maybe you could do something better, something more clever. And furthermore, we think that extension-based proofs are, you know, there's more to be, definitely more to be ex explored in this area. And, you know, it would be nice if we could formally prove that, you know, a lot of these open problems in the field, uh, they're open because extension-based proofs will not suffice. And finally, I think like one of the biggest goals that I would personally have if I was working on this stuff would be to, consider a topological characterization of space and time complexity. So basically like, you know, build a hel helicopter, don't go through a simulation, just figure out what this blob of stuff actually looks like and prove something meaningful about it. And I guess like here is a timeline of the stuff I did. And uh, in particular, it ends in June, 2019 where Faith approved my thesis. And uh, okay, that's about it. Thanks for listening, guys. Adele, I think you're still muted. You're right. Thanks very much, Jimmy. I think you offer some good insight about what role luck and hard work plays in doing anything, much less a PhD thesis. And I think it's important to make young people who are um, working towards their PhD now aware of that fact that it's not just all hard work or all luck, it's a combination. Um, does anyone have any questions in the audience? If you do, if you could put them in the Q&A, we'll forward them on to Jimmy to answer. And we'll wait a couple of minutes. And Jimmy, can you talk a little bit about what you're doing at the University of Michigan while we wait to see if there are any questions? Uh, yeah, so I basically uh, switch fields. Uh, in the sense that I'm working on something completely different, uh, I'm doing some stuff in randomized algorithms. It's mostly uh, probability and analysis. Well, we do have a, actually a comment yeah. and a question. Nir Shabat uh, um, says, Jimmy, wonderful work and a lovely presentation. Oh, uh, no. What's next? <laughs> <laughs> What's next? I don't know. I don't know. I mean, yeah, there's a lot of work, but you know, I'll, I'll leave it for somebody smarter than me. And uh, yeah. Great. Well, I want to thank everyone for joining us today and for Jimmy for this really wonderful presentation. This will go up on the CS Can Info Can website and we'll send out a note when it's ready so you can let your colleagues know, those who weren't able to join us today, that they can um, access the presentation. Thanks again, Jimmy, and thanks everyone for coming.